Well, hello, and thanks for joining us for our online service. We hope that you are encouraged and challenged today as we seek to know God and be changed by Him in a way that will change the world. We would really love the opportunity to connect with you. One way we do that is through our connection card. You can fill out our digital connection card in the Chets Creek Church app or at chetscreek.com forward slash connect. There you can let us know that you watched today, share any questions that you may have, and tell us how we can pray for you. The best way to really get connected here at Jets is to come visit us in person at one of our three campuses in the Jacksonville area. We have ministry for all ages and would love the chance to connect with you and your family. To learn more about locations and service times, go to chetscreek.com forward slash locations. Thanks again for tuning in. Now let's worship together. Good morning, everybody. Please stand and worship with us today.
Christ and this perfection took the blame But hallelujah Let's think about the words For our part For our part in it would take the cross yeah. Salvation paid for at the highest cost And our redemption gained at heaven's loss Oh how What can wash away my sin? And nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Oh, nothing but the blood. And there is nothing strong enough to stand. done with outstretched hands. For now salvation flows for every man. Oh, hallelujah. And whosoever calls upon His name will find the guilt and burdens rolled away. Please be seated. Good to see you this morning. Glad that you're with us and uh, hope you've had a great day. Had a great weekend this weekend. Our men's conference was uh, Friday night and Saturday and very special thanks to our the, head, the men that head up our men's ministry and uh, so just a super weekend, but it is, it is moving forward. We're, you know, think about this. We are about one month away from Thanksgiving. Uh, we're two months away from Christmas, 
and we're about um, 10, 11 weeks away from a new year. Isn't that shocking when you think about it, you know? And uh, so we have a lot to be thankful for and a lot of work to do still. And so just a couple quick things. Uh, it's gonna be talked a bit more about, but baptism uh, this afternoon, the water temperature is gonna be 75. So you don't wanna miss that baptism and uh, see what all the God's doing. And I hope you'll come be a part of that at six o'clock. But one of the things that we've done historically at Chats is we provided Christmas gifts for kids in the, uh, at the Florida Baptist Children's Home, the foster care program. We provided Samaritan's Purse um, uh, gift box, Christmas boxes to all over the world. But we have historically for many years provided Thanksgiving for, um, for needy families. And so out in the atrium is a bag, looks just like this, Thanksgiving bag. And it says what to put in it. And you need to bring it back by the middle of November. And you do not put a frozen turkey in the bag, okay? You put a gift card for $10 that'll buy a frozen turkey or ham, whatever meat they would want for Thanksgiving. And so this is a Thanksgiving uh, uh, gift drive bag. And that's one of the ways we can be generous to people in our community. Last year we collected, I think, over 500 of these across all three campuses. So we'd love to have you join us in this. It's not very expensive to provide Thanksgiving meal for someone and it really does meet a great need. And so take one or several and bring them back. And it's one of, your, one of the ways you can show generosity during this season. If you're a guest with us today, we'd love to have you fill out a Connect card. Let us know what brought you here, how, how you came to be here, and how we can help get you involved here at Chet's. So grab that, fill it out, drop in the plate, but it comes by just in a moment. Ask our ushers that would have made their way to the front. And by the ways they're doing that, if you don't have time to fill out a Connect card on your way out today, there's boxes at both doors. You could drop those in there as well. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll continue on um, to worship through the act of giving. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Help us, oh God, to put you first in our lives. Help us to give faithfully, because everything we have above nothing is a gift from you. And help us be generous with and for those who are not as blessed as we are. And that's our prayer we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. We're heaven's spun creations, His pride and adoration, treasures woven by His love. His careful hands, they hold us safe within His promise calling end of destiny we're heaven spun creation his pride and adoration treasures woven by his love his careful hands they hold us safe within his promise 
again this morning for always being there, faithful. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Go ahead and have a seat. So we believe that God has a plan and purpose for everything because we read it in the Bible. But there's a difference between theology and your practiced theology. And in honesty, sometimes when we hear that God's ways are higher than ours, um, I don't always believe him. So I was in this situation where I was studying overseas and doing ministry overseas, and um, there was a change in our finances that caused me to look for a new place to live. And um, an atheist family who lived just down the street offered me a room uh, in exchange for a few hours of elder sitting. And so I thought, well, it can't be that bad. So I moved into this basement. Um, I have a filing cabinet for a kitchen. Uh, it has an instant pot, an electric kettle, and a little slow cooker. And I was really beginning to wonder what God's ways and purposes could possibly be, especially when I found out that um, the other residents in the house uh, was a prostitute and a drug dealer. And uh, so here I am in this situation, not really convinced that God knows what he's doing. So I was praying that how could God possibly use this situation for his glory? And um, then what could make this matter worse but COVID? So here I am stuck in a pandemic um, with diminishing funds, living in a house that can only be described as insane, um, far away from my husband and children with no prospect of being able to fly back. And my 12 and a half hours a week of elder sitting turned into 40 to 50 hours with no hope of doing any ministry outside of the house that I was in. And gradually, um, my Christianity, despite my bad behavior, began to show in extraordinary ways to the point where um, the gentleman in the house who had Parkinson's disease, who was a physicist, asked me to pray with him. And uh, I held his hand and I prayed with him. And got to share God's word with him in a way that I would never have done had God not allowed this situation to occur. And the drug dealer guy that was upstairs, who was on probation for a race crime, wept as we took care of this man together and saw the hand of God. Had I have known the situation beforehand, I would never have opted to go to minister away from my family. Had I have known the financial situation would have been unstable, I would have questioned God and put the brakes on. But I was forced into a situation where I had to trust God no matter what. And it's the same Christ that was raised from the dead that lives inside of me, that gave me this wonderful opportunity to be salt and light and minister his grace, goodness and mercy to this family. Outstanding. Uh, Usha and Matt are two of the missionaries that are members of Chess Creek Church and that um, we support financially and prayerfully. And so uh, they're actually in town for a couple of weeks. And, um, and so thanks to Usha for sharing. And just as a side note, uh, ladies, if you have not signed up for the, uh, the event coming up, well, actually, this is Usha sitting right there. Usha, wave your hand if I can see you. So, Usha, so thank you for sharing your testimony so much. And uh, how long y'all in? You're in town for a couple of weeks. Leave tomorrow. Leave tomorrow. Okay, that doesn't that doesn't surprise me one bit. So, anyway, thank you for sharing that. But also in the She Loves Out Loud conference that's coming up uh, weekend after next, ladies, um, Usha, you will be doing one of the prayer segments right during that conference and. Uh, and so that's an international conference. Women all over the world will see that. 
Anusha will be one of the featured ladies praying um, during that conference. So thanks for doing that. Matt and Anusha, I love you guys. Glad you're with us for a day. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there, okay? Today we're going to talk about what Usha shared. And that is, we know that God is at work. And God's work is to reconcile the world to himself. And God has called us to be reconcilers, to be ambassadors for Christ. You'll study that in life group this morning, if you've not already been. And God has called us to make a difference in the world. And God wants to have a love relationship with us so we can know him and, and see him work in us and through us. And so that we, we can see who we are according to God and not according to us. And then today we're going to look at the fact that this God who's at work in the world this God who loves us so much, he sent his only son, Jesus, down the cross for us. He invites us to join him in his work. And before we go too deep into this, let me just say this. Many times we miss what God wants to do in us because we have this mindset of big. Well, I could never be Billy Graham. I, I could never be Mother Teresa I, I could never be this person or that person. Can I just say this to you? God didn't ask you to. He just asked you to be you. To be you, Christ in you, to a lost and dying world. And for some, that might mean serving two-year-olds. Who is to know that the message and the love that you show that two-year-old doesn't lead them to ultimately accept Christ, doesn't lead them to ultimately be involved themselves in serving Christ in some capacity. Or your ministry might be to feed the hungry or, or to, to minister to, to single moms who are struggling. Or I mean, the key is not what God wants you to do, but the fact that God, the God of the universe would want to do something and work in you. And we'll talk about this a little bit deeper as we move along. In Jeremiah 1.5, the Bible says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. I read an article just the other day. As I, as I read this verse, I'm reminded of this. I read an article just the other day about a family up in Iowa uh, that went through um, fertil fertility drugs. They'd had one child, had a lot of had some miscarriages, so used fertility a certain fertility drug. And this was happened some 20 years ago, and found out she was pregnant. And when she went to the doctor, ladies, I want you to imagine this. She went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you have seven babies in your womb. Seven. And they showed a picture of the ultrasound, and I always wondered about that. How, how would, you know, what are twins and triplets? Seven. And the ultrasound showed it was like a condominium. <laughs> I mean, there was a baby and there was a, a, a membrane and a baby and a membrane and a baby and a membrane and a baby and a membrane, you know, and it showed all these babies in that mother's room. And the doctor, in fact, had said to her, you know, you might want to do what we call a uh, special selection. We're, we can see how healthy these different babies are in the womb. And, and, and she and she, the doctor encouraged her to maybe abort a couple of them so that the other five would live. And she said, no, our faith would not allow us to do that. We trust God through this. And she had all seven babies. Uh, they, they were born healthy. And, and uh, they just graduated college here about two years ago. All seven of them, you know. Or some, several actually went military, some college. And as I, as I thought about that, before you were in the womb, God knew you. While you were in the womb, God knew you. Uh, he, he knew everything about you. And he said to Jeremiah, I had holy plans for you, a prophet to the nations. And I'm reading now through the book of Jeremiah as, during my Bible study time. And I really have become enamored with this man, Jeremiah, who, who God called him to be a prophet to the nations. And some of the best prophecies about the coming of Christ are found in the book of Jeremiah. It's pretty, pretty cool. Some of the stuff God revealed to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah sometimes kind of went kicking and screaming because he suffered a lot for his being obedient to God's word. But here's the deal. God has called you. He's invited you. 
and better than any invitation you could ever receive. Whether you received an invitation from some local political leader, uh, the governor, the president of the United States, you will never receive an invitation any greater than the invitation that comes from and for Jesus Christ. So here's two things we've already discovered. God is already at work to accomplish his purpose in the world. Remember, Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. That whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we know that is God's call to reconcile men to himself. And God wants to do that through you and me. And, but he's not going to do it like forces to. He wants to do it based on, number two, a personal relationship that is available for us to have with him. God has opened up the doors of heaven to us, and he has made himself available to us. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Boy, what a great promise and what a great offer and what a great opportunity. And so this morning, I want to share with you from God's word how God invites you to join him in his work and really how simple it is to join him in his work. We're going to further, let's pray and let's look at this third uh, reality of experiencing God. God invites you and me to be involved in the greatest work the world will ever know. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Would you speak through me this morning, God? Would you allow uh, us to hear from you? Let your Holy Spirit lead and guide this conversation and... Uh, I just pray, God, that you would, in a supernatural way, have your way in this service today. And God, take control. May we leave here challenged and changed. May we leave here different. And God, may we leave here accepting this fact by faith. You love us, and you want us to be a part of your work. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, last night, just to give you a heads up, this past week, Kitty and I have a little, we have two dogs. One's a little puppy, Molly. And Molly got to visit the vet this week for a little snip snip, if you know what I'm talking about. And Molly got a little snip snip on Tuesday. The problem is um, they put her on some pain meds that made her crazy. I'm decided, made her crazy. Just like, woo, 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 you know, woo, 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 you know. And we had to keep her calm. You had that cone cone of you can't touch anything on her head, you know, kind of thing. And, and clearly, and I called the vet and he said, is her, is decision okay? Yeah. Eating okay? Yeah. I said, but she's running into things. She's like bouncing off the wall. You know, she'll be fine. Uh, thank you so much. You're not having to live with her, you know? And so we're, we're putting in her crate every night. Well, undoubtedly last night, Molly came off of her five day high and, uh, and all night long, uh, Kitty and I got up half a dozen times with her. She was whining and barking to get out of her crate, you know. And so, I don't know if y'all saw, don't, please don't hear what I'm not saying, but it's pretty funny. I don't know if y'all saw the president was interviewed a couple of days ago. And I think he fell asleep during the interview. If I fall asleep during the sermon, just somebody coming up and wake me up, okay? Just so, okay. wake up, Spike. Okay, so I, I am, I, I'm doing my best. But I'm asking God to work through me despite three or four hours of sleep last night with a stupid, because of a stupid dog. And so, you know, I did like, like Mr. Beam. You know, and God said, you know, this kind of deal. <laughs> we'll make it through. I've had a lot of coffee already. But I, I, I want you to imagine with me. I'm just giving you my excuse in advance, okay? Uh, anything I say cannot be used against me today. I, I want you to imagine with me that God calls you up and says, I want to do something through you and how you respond to that. Because many times we miss what God wants to do through us because it's not as big as we think it might should be. And we have this picture, well, you know, I, God wants me to do this, or I want to be a part of this. But let me just say that God does not want you to be the next Billy Graham. He does not want you to be the next Mother Teresa. He does not want you to be the next whatever. He wants you to be the best you you can be. And the point of God wanting to work through you is, as years ago in a conference I was in with Rick Warren, 
he made this comment. He said, every morning before I get out of bed, before I, my feet hit the floor, I pray this simple prayer. God, today is your day. Use me as you see fit. And so that doesn't evoke this idea of really big stuff. That invokes this idea of use me today. Use me today. As I talk with people, as I walk with people, as I work, as, I, as I'm at the gas station, as I'm in the grocery store. And God, when you reveal to me your work, when you reveal to me you're doing something, let me be faithful. Your life and my life would be so much simpler if instead of trying to figure out what God wants to do through us, and I've spent years talking to and, and counseling with and encouraging young men and women who feel called to ministry, um, and invariably, there, there's, there's this idea of chasing after. I just want to be the best I can be. I just want to do what God wants me to do. I just want to, and it's like, hey, take a breath. Slow down. So let me start with this. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing now, wherever you're working, whatever you're involved in, where, wherever you are, God knows where you are. And so be the best you, you can be right there. Make yourself available to God where you are. And if he wants you to go somewhere else or do something different, he knows where you are. But quit reaching after and searching after and, and pulling toward. I just think there's so much more. I just think there's so much more. Why don't you be the best you can be where you are now and see if maybe God is not using that just like he did with Moses four years in the wilderness to prepare you for the what next. So here are the principles we're going to look at today as we consider that God invites you to join him in his work. So how do we understand God's invitation? 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he's given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors. And God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as through Christ himself, we're here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassadors. I learned that verse when I was six years old. We are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. What kind of ambassador are you and I? I told you years ago, and if you haven't heard me say this, I'll say it again. I do not put a little Christian fish on my truck because I'm not sure that my driving always represents Christ well, okay? You know, I, I heard a... I heard a, a police officer, Derek, say something to me the other day. Uh, he, he said, you know, I keep pulling these people over and they got these church stickers on their car, you know. And I thought, yeah, that's why I don't have one on my car, you know. Uh, but, because sometimes I'm not ambassador for Christ when I drive. Sometimes I'm not a great ambassador for Christ when I'm at the grocery store or whatever. But so how can we be ambassadors for Christ? We do it by this. Number one. Understand God has one clear purpose in the world and you represent Christ in fulfilling that purpose. And his purpose is very clear. It is God who saved us and chose us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan before the world began. Hear that. Jesus coming to earth and down the cross was not plan two. It was plan one. To show his love and kindness to us to Jesus Christ his clear purpose is to rescue men from destruction. His clear purpose is that all will be saved. His clear purpose is that everyone would come to know God and be saved from death and hell. I want you to think about this. Talk about this in life group this morning. How many of you have ever seen those ASPCA commercials showing these poor little pitiful dogs and, and, and they play these song, this song, you know, in the eyes of an angel fly away. It's so sad and it's slow. And they show this one-eyed, one-legged dog, you know, whimpering and all. And we'll, they say, give money and we'll give millions of dollars to rescue an animal. And don't, I'm not against this, okay? I love animals. But it's gonna live for seven years, eight years at best. We'll spend millions of dollars to keep someone uh, from the death penalty, 
who maybe committed the crime, but just don't believe in the death penalty. And if, you're, if that's you, great. But the truth of the matter is, every person walking around us on earth who doesn't know Jesus is dead man walking. They have the death penalty. And we have the answer, and it didn't cost us a dime. And that is the call that Jesus has on our lives. His one clear purpose is to lead people to salvation through Jesus Christ. Number two, God's purpose, why I do not know, but God's purpose is to involve people who will accept and obey his mission. Why does God choose to use us? I don't know. I don't know. When, when God said to Moses, I want you to leave the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and I want you to go to this land flow with milk and honey, and then he mentions the seven groups that already lived there. Why didn't God just go in and just clean them all out and give the land rent free? I don't know. But God has chosen in his infinite wisdom and in his purpose to involve us to be a part of his mission. Deuteronomy 10, uh, 12. And now Israel... What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God? By the way, this is a great life verse. This is a verse we all should know and memorize because this really is, this is living for, this is discipleship in a nutshell. How to live for God in a nutshell. What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord's God with all your heart and all your soul. If you want to know what it means to be a disciple of Christ, Type out and put that word on your mirror and read it every day. Because that's what it is. Fear of the Lord your God means put total trust and faith in him. Walk in all his ways. You can't know his ways without spending time in his word. Love him. You learn to love him. You should spend time with him. Serve him. Use the gifts and talents he's given you with all your heart, with all your soul. God expects all of us that are saved for eternity to make his purpose our purpose. As someone said wisely, when we say yes to Jesus, he invites us to be a part of his family business. We're a part of the family business, which leads to the third truth. God's purpose for your life is not to be the next something, but to be the first someone, to be you, who you are. God created you to be you. It's based on who God created you to be. Now, I want you to just look at me, and I can tell you that God did not create me to be an NBA basketball player, pretty sure. God did not create me to be a lot of things. There's a lot of things God didn't create me to be. I was sharing the life group this morning. God did not create me to be a Greek professor at some seminary. That never is, never was, never will happen. But God created me to be the best me I could be in the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out the work God's called me to do. And he did you as well. God did not create me to be a, an English teacher. Trust me. Or a math professor. No. But thank God there were English teachers and math professors. And, 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 and thank God there, there are people that God created to be certain things to carry out his purpose. Ephesians 2. God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which he had planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. Ultimately, our purpose is God's purpose. And that doesn't mean each of us have the same job, but it means we're all on the same team. Each of us have different jobs, different responsibilities. You, you know, I've, I've heard coaches say this for years, just do your job. If you ever watch a football game or soccer or basketball, many times the opposing team scores because the person who was supposed to do a specific job got distracted or got cut off or, or, or tried to do somebody else's job or tried to do too much. And the point of this is when everybody does their job, everything falls into place. When we all do our job, then the work gets done. So let's, let's look at the man of the Bible very quickly, a man named Gideon. And let's see how God used these seven realities in Gideon's life to fulfill the purpose God had for Gideon. So I'm going to go this kind of quick. Again, the Israelites did leave on the eyes of the Lord. 
And for seven years, he turned them over to the hands of the Midianites. These were, these were, you know, like Lawrence of Arabia, Arab type people. They were head on camels and they came in in droves and that's what they were doing. And in fact, it was impossible to count these men. And they invaded the land and took everything away from them and then rode off and into the sunset kind of deal, you know. And the Israelites cried out to God and they found themselves in a great crisis. They had been rebelling against God and God allowed the Midians free reign because he was using them to draw them back to him. Here's truth number one. God is always at work around us. His purpose will always prevail. God is at work around us. We may not see it, we may know, but God is at work reconciling himself to men. So look at it says, the Israelites cried out to God. He sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt, from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them before you. I gave you this land. I said to you, I'm the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you chose not to listen to me. God said, I've fulfilled my purpose in you, but you still rebel against me. And God's intended purpose was for Israel, ultimately, as God's chosen people, out of Israel would come Jesus Christ. And out of the Jewish faith would come a greater understanding of how we can have a relationship with Christ. Which leads to the second reality. God pursues a love relationship with you. And so God's Israel cried out. God said, this is why you're going through this. And yet God still loved them. He still pursued a love relationship with them. And he was going to fulfill his purpose in them in this time. And so the angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree in Ophrah. They belonged to Joash the Ab Abizarite, whatever is how you say that. And there was his son Gideon. He was threshing wheat in a wine press. So he literally was threshing wheat in a covered, blocked, kind of, under, you know, in the ground place, kind of hiding out. We were not talking about Samson here, folks. We're not talking about one of, you know, one of the Marvel comic superheroes. We're talking about a guy who was threshing wheat, hoping the Midianites didn't know he had the wheat, so he was hiding out. And it says he was threshing wheat, keep it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he said, the Lord is with you. I love this mighty warrior. Gideon is not a mighty warrior, all right? God was going to continue to fulfill his purpose in someone who did not see that in himself. And let me say to you, God will do great and mighty things to you if you allow him to, and more than you could ever think, hope, or imagine. He will use you beyond you think any ability you might have if you allow him to. Amen. And we see in the story of Gideon, that's what's going on here. And so the third reality is, God invites you to join him in his work. Gideon replied, sir, if the Lord is with us, why are we going through all of this? Where are all his wonders that our father told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Now this is Gideon back talking to God. And he said, but now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. And the Bible says, the Lord turned to him and said, remember before it was an angel Lord. Now it says the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. I am sending you. That's what I'm going to send you to do. So here, Gideon's having a conversation with God. He's asking questions, and God didn't strike him down. God didn't say, don't back talk, talk me, boy. He allowed Gideon to speak, but he did not take Gideon's fears, concerns, or even argumentativeness Personally, he said, go and do, I am sending you, which leads to the four truth. God speaks to you to reveal his purpose. We know as we study this, he speaks through his word, through prayer, through the church and through circumstances. But so Gideon now begins to say, not why aren't you doing? Now we say why he can't do it. He says, but Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in the family of Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. He said, man, I'm the weakest of the weak of the weak. And the Lord answered, literally, it ain't about you. He said, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. And Gideon said, so if I've now found favor in your eyes, give me a sign 
that this is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offer and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. See, Gideon can't imagine God is speaking to him. I don't know if Gideon's really going to get an offer to bring it back. Or he's hoping if he leaves, God will just go away. I don't know what he's thinking. But he goes to bring an offering to present it before the Lord. And God said to Gideon, it ain't you. It's what I want to do through you. Which leads to the fifth reality. God's invitation always leads to a crisis of belief. When God calls you to do something, when he calls you to serve, there can be some fear and trepidation. <clears throat> there can be some times in your life where you really struggle with, wow, I, I just don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I can do this. I, I, I don't, I, maybe if I shut up, God will go away. Maybe they'll find somebody else. And that's what's going on here. So the Bible says all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other Eastern people joined forces. So more than just the Midianites, all the Eastern people joined forces, crossed over the Jordan, and camped in the Valley of Jezreel. And Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, then I want to put out a woolen fleece. You ever heard about putting out a fleece? That's where it comes from. But I'm, I'm going to put something out, and if God does this, you know, then I'll know it's God. And so he said, I'm going to put out a woolen fleece, as, you know, sheepskin. And if there's dew on the fleece only and the ground is die, dry, then I'll know it was you. And that's exactly what he did. That's when he got out, he squeezed water out of the fleece and the ground was dry. And then and Gideon said, well, Lord, don't be angry with me. But let me just ask you one more request, just to make double sure it's you. He said, I'm going to do the same thing, but this time I want the fleece to be dry and the ground to be wet. And that night, God did that. So Gideon, Gideon had no out and no excuse. Like Moses and every major leader in the Bible, all the New Testament, when God's call seems too big, too difficult, or just something we don't want to do, we're looking for every way possible, like Moses did, to get out of it. And yet sometimes, sometimes God will continue to push through where we have to make a decision, yes or no. And that decision involves reality number six, that I must make major adjustments in my life. I've got to be willing to do different than. I've got to be willing to submit and surrender to. I've got to be willing to say, yes, God, be God in me. If he wants to do something in me to join God in his work. So early in the morning, Jeroboam, that's name for Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. And the Lord, Gideon, the Lord God said to Gideon, I love this part. So not only is he asking Gideon to do something, it seems like he's tying his hands to be able to do it. So God said to Gideon, you got too many men. You got too many men. Can you have too many men if you're going to war? Can you have, I mean, honestly, really God? I've got too many men. And so he says, you have too many men for me to deliver meat into your hands. So in order that Israel will not boast and say, we did it, I want you to do this. I want you to announce to these soldiers, if anybody's afraid, you can leave now with no repercussions. Somebody's going to talk bad about you. And the Bible says 22,000 of the men left out of 32,000 and left 10,000. Now, if I'm getting, I'm saying, okay, two thirds of the men are gone. Thanks, God. Appreciate it. You know, thanks for showing up. And then God said, still too many men. So if you remember the story, it's on to take those 10,000 men to the water to drink water. And he says, those, and this is, this is an interesting thing. There's been a lot of debate about what it is, but it says those who lap up the water, they get to stay and the other ones get to go. And so out of the 10,000, only 300 of them lapped up water. And some scholars said that the 300, you know, did it like this, as opposed to getting on the hands and knees. I don't know. Because nobody really knows. Completely. I've heard, seen different things there. But however it is that God separated them, 300 did it one way, and the other 9,700 did it a different way. And God said, okay, you got enough now. Send the 9,700 off 
and you're going to have these 300 men with you. <laughs> you know, Gideon doesn't say it, but you know what he's thinking. Really, God? Really? I mean, you couldn't keep 600 or 1,000 or 2,000? 10,000 was not enough. And so 300 men stay with Gideon. It took great faith for Gideon to move ahead with these 300 men. These Midianites and all the other armies with him have been pestering Jerusalem, Israel for seven years now. And they came in and now they were double and triple that number. And they were coming in pretty much just to take over. But here's the seventh reality. You will experience God as you choose to obey him and allow him to work through you. Here's the rest of the story. God said to Gideon, get up and go down against the camp because I'm about to give them into your hands. Gideon arrived, the Bible says, just as a man there in the camp was telling his friend a dream he had had. He said, I had a dream. He said, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into our camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And this enemy friend said to him, well, I know what that is. He said, this is nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, Israelite. And he goes on to prophesy, God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon overheard this dream and the interpretation, he worshiped God and he returned to the camp of Israel and he said, get up. The Lord God has given the Midianite camp into your hands. And he and the 300 men reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, middle of the night. And he had separated them out of the groups of hundreds, a hundred here, hundred here, hundred here. And he gave them two things. He gave them a glass jar. Now, I can't, I don't know what this was. So just imagine a mason jar, okay? That's the only way I know how to picture it, okay? Mason jar with a candle in it and a trumpet. And he said to them, grasp these, these torches and, and, and in one hand and in the right hand, the trumpet. And he says, I want you to shout a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the Bible says they ran, they ran flying into the camp threw down the torches, blew the trumpet, and the men of Midian began to attack each other and kill each other and then run away. And they got chased by these 300. And it says they caught up with one of the kings named Oreb at the rock of Oreb. The only thing I can think about is they took him to this rock, cut his head off, head off there. They called it the rock of Oreb. And then they caught this man named Zeb, at the place they call the wine press of Zeb. And they pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Orb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan River. God did. In fact, I, I do not know. I do not know of any other time in scripture where such a small band of people saw God do such a great victory in their lives. But that's who God is. And so how do we understand God's invitation? How do, we, how do we live out these seven principles of experiencing God? These seven realities. Let me just give you four quick things. To know God's invitation, know what he wants to do in and through you. The biggest obstacle we have to serving God and being used by God is self-centeredness. It's living for self. And so when God is at work and God wants to have a love relationship with us and then God wants to use us to fulfill his purpose. Here's four truths real quick I want you to get. Number one, and then I'll start with the letter S. God's invitation requires our first step, which is surrender. Amen. Surrender. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ the longer I who live it is Christ who lives in me. Be assured that God will not invite you and you'll not be used by God unless you choose to surrender and trust him no matter what. Number two, God's invitation demands that we begin to look for God at work when we begin to see him as spiritualized. Jesus said, do not say four months, do not say four months in the harvest, but I say to you, open your eyes and look at the fields. 
for they're ripe in the harvest. The fields are ripe in harvest where you work, where you play, where you go to school, where, who you hang out with. The fields are ripe in the harvest. You just need to be available and open for God to use you where you are living, what you're doing. Number three, God's invitation implies that you'll not be willing to sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your act of worship. So surrender, see what spiritual eyes, sacrifice. And then the fourth is the most important. And that's what Gideon had to finally decide. And that's this. God's invitation accepts and recognizes that God is always sufficient. God will not call you to do what he will not supply through and for you to do. God would not ask you to do anything in your own power, just like Gideon. He will ask you to do what he will gift and provide for you to do. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. If your God can't meet all your needs, then friend, you're worshiping the wrong God. That's the bottom line. God wants to do more and through me and you than we could ever imagine because he is sufficient. So this morning, let me ask you this question. Where's God at work? And what has he asked you to join him in? And are you willing? Are you willing to be used by God beyond, beyond what you think you're able? Because that's the call God has in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, our challenge is to trust you. Our challenge, the Lord, is to believe that you want to and will do a great and mighty work in our lives. Our challenge this morning, God, is to be willing to surrender, is to be willing to put you first, is to be willing to see and open to seeing where you're at work, to be willing to make sacrifices necessary to do the work you call us to do and willing to trust that you are sufficient to meet every need according to your riches and glory for us to be who you call us to create us to be. So this morning, God, I pray that some of us would pray simply, Lord, I'm available. You're able. Use me. Or maybe someone today, Lord, today I give my heart and life to Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. That's what's missing in my life whatever that might be, somewhere in the middle. Let us respond to your call on our life today. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our hope, who is the only hope this world has. Amen. 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 We have pastors down front, prayer leaders available for you. I ask you to stand. You might want to pray with someone. There's power where we pray together. You might want to come to the altar and kneel and pray. Whatever God has called you to do this morning, I want to invite you to respond as God leads this morning. As we worship, as we sing. You respond in faith to God's call in your life. You come.
Wonderful to be worshiping with y'all. My name is Jody Coleman. Y'all can have a seat for just one second. Um, I just want to like for one second, I sit up here when I do the announcements and it is so beautiful to hear you guys um, when we worship together. I just kind of pause for a minute and take it in. Um, I get kind of nervous to do the announcements and so it helps me a lot to like hear you guys and just worship for a second. So thank you. Thank you for being my church family. Um, in that moment, so beautiful. So a um, couple of things before we go out to the big bad world, um, just wanted to let you guys know, ladies, today is the very last day to sign up for the She Loves Out Loud simulcast. It's happening November 5th, it's a Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Um, there's a little TV booth thing in the corner of the atrium, so sign up over there or at chetscreek.com forward slash women. Today's the last day, so don't leave here and let it fall out of your brain. Um, the next thing is tonight is our beach baptism. Last one of the season. It's supposed to be really beautiful. The water might be a little chilly, but um, I would love to see you guys out there. It's such a beautiful way for us to worship together. Um, lots more going on at Chet's. Check the backside of your bulletin for everything else. And the Chet's Creek app has everything as well, but Pastor Spike's gonna pray us out. Thank you, Josie. Let's close in prayer. If you're a guest with us today, I'd love to meet you. I'll be right down front. Some of our staff will as well. Swing by, introduce yourself. Let us know how we can help serve you and um, help you get connected here at Chess. Let's pray together and then we'll go. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. We pray, oh God, that you would use us for your glory. Show us where you're at work. Uh, reveal to us how you want us to join you in that work. Give us the courage and the faith to trust you in it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great, great day, great week, and we'll see you back next Sunday. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Are you looking for a great way to engage with God's Word during our Experiencing God series? Just text the word BIBLE to 904-478-9226 to sign up to receive our verse of the day text during the next eight weeks. We hope to see you soon. Now, go join God in changing the world.